Hi and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Full house tonight. Tonight we continue on with verses number 58 and 59, which read as follows. Yatha sankara dhanasming ujjitasming mahapate padumang tatha jayetha suchigandhang manoramang evang sankara bhutesu andabhute putujane Atiro Chatipanyaya Samma Sambuddha Savako. Two verses tonight. The meaning of which is approximately Yata Sankaradanas means just as in a rubbish heap discarded by the side of the highway. A lotus can grow even there. That is well scented and <clears throat> delightful. So too, a wang so too, or just just so in the in the heap of beings or the heap of becoming. No, the heap of beings. Sankara Bhutesu in the heap of becomings. Andabhute Putujane who are blind and full of defilements. Atiro Chatipanyaya Samma Sambuddha Savako the disciple of the perfectly enlightened Buddha shines exceedingly or outshines outshines them all with it, with his or her wisdom. So, two verses. Two verses, one, one saying of the Buddha. And one story. Now again, as with all these stories, sometimes we get complaints about the stories being too fanciful or unbelievable. And I think there's a confusion between the actual teaching and the history behind the teaching. Now I'm, I'm among the first to say that these histories are, are fanciful and most likely uh, exaggerated, um, but that has no, sh should have no bearing on the teaching. Whether something happened or didn't happen, uh, at little bearing on the teaching. Obviously if you don't believe in magic at all, um, then you're going to have a hard time with many aspects of the Buddha's teaching and so there's some reflection on, on the teaching and the fact that these sorts of things could actually happen and I would say probably not as uh, extravagant as they are portrayed to have occurred but uh, certainly some sort of magic or what seems to be magic some sort of extrasensory perception appears to be uh, quite possible and, and, and uh, existent in, in the universe but that, that isn't the core of, of the message of what's being taught here obviously this here teaching of the Buddha has nothing to do with anything supernatural but the story does it's a good story, it's a funny story it's one that's quite memorable and so I hope I can do it justice it's quite long as well relatively speaking so there are these two uh, two, two friends and uh, one of them's name is Sirigutta, and the other one's name is, if I remember correctly, Garaha Dinna. Does anybody remember the name? Garaha Dinna. Sound familiar to anyone? I think it's Garaha, Garaha Dinna, I think is his name. Anyway, we'll give them these two names. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Garaha Dinna and Sirigutta. And two friends living in Savati. And Garahadina was a disciple of Nigantanata Buddha, who was uh, also known as Mahavira 
the leader of the Jain religion and uh, well known for its naked ascetics. In the time of the Buddha, these were the guys who walked around naked. And even still, apparently today, you'll see some of them. I never saw them when I was in India, but <coughs> apparently they're still walking around naked. In India, this is their, practice, their religious practice. And Siri Gutta was a follower of the Buddha, a supporter of the Buddha. And they were, they were both fairly well off, so they were considered to be, um, considered to be uh, some sort of uh, main supporter or important supporter of, of the, two, the two schools. Now, Garahadina, for a long time, he would... Uh, I know Garahadina was once speaking with the uh, Niganta Nataputtas, the, the uh, naked ascetics, and they would, they, they would say to him, hey, why don't you tell Siri Gutta to, to, to come and pay respect to us? He's got lots of money, and uh, what's the, what is he doing paying, paying respect to the Buddha? What is he doing uh, supporting the Buddha? What does he hope to gain from supporting Samana Gotama? Why don't you tell him that he should come and support us and give us stuff and, and, and uh, give us offerings instead? Of course, uh, you can imagine that they only had his best interests at heart, right? Uh, and so Garadina, he, he took this to heart and he thought, wow, these guys must really, yeah, I, of course, I should tell my friend about the great teaching that I'm getting from these naked guys. And uh, so, so he went to... Uh, he went, <laughs> kind of funny, huh? Mark Twain once said, naked people have... Uh, what is it? Clothes make the man. You know this saying, clothes make the man? Clothes make the man. Naked people have very little influence on society. Well, in India, that's not true. Naked people had quite an influence because there was an idea that they'd given up everything. You see, you still have attachments because you're wearing clothes. If you weren't attached to anything, you could just go naked. What you got to say to that? Huh? <laughs> so he was thinking, yeah, this is... Uh, these ascetics, they don't know... These, these Gotama and his followers, they don't know what they're talking about because... Look at them, they're still wearing clothes, covering up their bodies as though they've got something to hide. Well, and the truth is, there is kind of something to hide, right? And uh, the body is something distracting. So we wear clothes as a matter of norm, not because we're attached to something. We wear clothes in order to keep from distracting each other with our uh, bodies. That's part of the reason. Another part of the reason is for warmth. The guys who are naked, they're actually part of it is torturing themselves. They want to go around in the cold, Imagine walking naked in Winnipeg in the winter, no? It'd be an icicle. And uh, for heat, when it's too hot, then you put them on and, and put them over your head and keep cool. And when there are mosquitoes, right? Imagine going naked with the mosquitoes and the le leeches and everything. And thorns, not to mention thorns walking through the forest. Hard to walk through the forest if you're naked, let me tell you. Not that I've ever done it. Um, right, so uh, he went. He goes up to Siri Gutta and he starts bugging him constantly about this. He, he says it once, and Siri Gutta doesn't. He says, "Hey, what are you doing, paying paying respect and following and listening to the teachings of Samana Gotama? Come and listen to the teachings of my teachers and give them offerings and so on." And Siri Gutta didn't say anything because he's Buddhist, you know. He, he was just he was still a Putujana. He was still an ordinary world thing. But he was a follower of the Buddha, and so he understood, you know, you don't fight. Fighting and arguing and so on is not useful. So he just would sit his, sit still and uh, hold his peace. Until again and again and again and again. And constantly he was being bothered by Garadina. Come and pay respect to these guys. They're... And he says, look, finally he gets fed up and he says, look, mister, what is what is this? What is so great about these guys? What what's so wonderful? What do, what is it that they know that you keep bugging me about? That I should go and listen to their teaching? And Garadina says, What do they know? What don't they know? My teachers are masters of the past, the present, the future. They know all about everybody's bodily actions, verbal actions, mental actions, past, present, future. 
they know they're able to read other everything about other people's minds they know everything so if you did something they knew it there's no hiding from them it's like santa claus he knows when you're they know when you're naughty they know when you're nice they see you when you're sleeping you know that's just creepy no And uh, Sirigutta, Sirigutta is a clever man. He looks at him and he says, Really? Oh, shame on you for not telling me beforehand. Why didn't you tell me that these guys were so wonderful? In that case, bring them on over to my house. I want to pay respect to these guys. Bring them over and I'll feed them all and I'll, I'll support, I'll worship them. And That's just wonderful. You bring them over, I want to pay respect to these these." Uh, Naked guys. And uh, Garahadena, he's so excited, he says, Ah, oh, yeah, I knew I could convince you. And so he goes back to the naked ascetics and he says to them, Hey, tomorrow he's going to invite you to, to his house, come on over. Uh, and he's going to respect, he's going to, he's going to offer you food and, and worship you and so on, pay respect to you and so on. And they say, Did he tell you that? Yes, he told me himself. Oh, wonderful. So, Maybe not the next morning, it's like a week later. He needs some time to prepare. And so here's how he prepares. There's a spot at his home. He's a rich guy, you know. So he's got these two, two buildings. And in between these two buildings, he digs a... He digs a... Not funny yet. He digs a long ditch. And he fills it up with cow poop. And then he ties two stakes, one on either end of the ditch, and, and puts a rope between them. And then he takes some, some seats, some wooden benches, kind of thing, or maybe they're like chairs. Maybe he had like, uh, like stools or something. And the front legs would be on the ground, and the back legs would be on the rope. Uh, it was probably some kind, they were probably touching some kind of, like in Thailand, uh, they use, they have these square, like about this big, and then it's got legs down, and the monks would sit on them, kind of thing. And, uh, and so the, the legs would be probably big legs, like this big, and you just, and it's on the rope. And he set them up, and then he covered them up with these uh, coverlets, red carpets or something. And then he, he, he took these big, he had, these, had them scrub out these pots of, uh, these clay pots, uh, wash them out, scrub them, and cover them up empty, and then smear the outside with food, like porridge on one and ghee on the other, put some splashes of ghee on it, and one with uh, cake crumbs and so on, and cover, cover them up with, with, with banana leaves or so on, and put them out. And then uh, Garhadina came along and he said, uh, so have you, have, you, have you prepared? Oh, yes, yes, I made lots of food and I set out the seats. And Garhadina says, where is it? And he says, over there. And he shows them the pots and the pots look like they're full of food. And he shows them the seats and they look wonderful and, and, and really great. And uh, Garhadina says, great. And he goes back and he gets his naked ascetic guys. And they come back to the house. And Garahadina says, so, you, you're the ones who are supposed to know everything, right? You know everything about the past, the present, and the future? Well, we'll see. If you go in there, there's no food in there. If you go in there, I'm going to have you, you're going to fall into that ditch, and I'm going to beat you with sticks, have you beaten with sticks and chased away. And he does. They go in, and they're about, one of them's about to sit down. He says, wait, 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 we've got a custom in this house that you have to follow when you sit. It's a, it's a time-honored tradition. Everyone has to stand in front of their seats and sit down all at once. <laughs> and they're like, well, okay. When in Rome, no, it's his house, his rules. So they stand in front of the seats and he says, and, oh, and he's, got his, he's, got his, he's told his, um, his guys to stand behind the seats. This, I think, was added. I don't think this is... Uh, it seems kind of a weird part of the story. But anyway, apparently he's got these guys prepared 
to, to grab onto the, the cloth because he doesn't want to get the cloth dirty. So just as they're about to sit down, he says, okay, sit down all at once. These guys pull the cloth out uh, and they sit down on the benches and the benches fall into the, the, the cow dung and, uh, and they're all mucked up, naked and, muck, naked and dirty. And then he has his men, then he closes the gate of, the, of his compound, right? And has them beaten with sticks. And once they're all beaten up, it's not really a Buddhist thing to do, which is why I say this guy, he's a supporter of the Buddha, <laughs> but he's certainly, certainly not an enlightened being by any means. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll see that there is a difference between a Buddhist Putujana and a, uh, a non-Buddhist Putujana, because the story, the end of the story has a bit of a bite to it. So... Um, he has them beaten, and then finally, when they're all beaten up, he op has them open the gate and chases them out, and they all go running back to their monastery. But another, the last thing he's done, just to add insult to injury, he's uh, put this whitewash, I don't know quite what that is, but he's put down something on the road to make it slippery, like, like rice flour or something, I don't know, or powder of clay or something, uh, like mud. And, uh, and he's made the whole road slippery, and so they're slipping and sliding and, and, and getting muddy and dirty and uh, are unable. They just look like fools, basically. He's just made total and complete fools. If you want to make someone a fool of someone, remember, here's how you do it. Not that Buddhists do such things. Practical joke. It was like a terrible, terrible practical joke he paid late on them. But his point was... Uh, you guys are supposed to know everything, and here you are, suckers. To he taught them a real lesson. You know, don't don't claim to be omniscient when you fall for such a stupid trick as that. <laughs> and uh, Garahadina gets really, really angry, and uh, he goes to the king, and he he has Siri Gutta brought forth before the king, and uh, he tells the king to punish him, and the king and the king asks the story, and Siri Gutta says, "Well, this guy was bugging me and telling me these guys were omniscient, so I wanted to test them out. They're obviously not omniscient. He was lying to me. It's, it was a real setup on my for, to to me. They they set me up." And the king says, "Yeah, well, that's true." And so he punishes Garahadina. He has him beaten and has the has all the uh, naked ascetics beaten again, apparently. So Garahadina is not a happy camper, and. Uh, He's, uh, for two weeks, he, he refuses to talk to, to uh, Sirigutta uh, until finally he comes up to Garahadin, uh, comes up to Sirigutta one day and says, Look, um, you know, this, I know we're, we had a disagreement, but we're friends. Why are we not talking? And Sirigutta says, Well, it's because you weren't talking to me. I was waiting for you to come and talk to me. And Garahadin says, That's fine. Let's go back and be friends. And after that, they were friends until one day. Sirigutta, Sirigutta says to Garahadina, well, why don't, you know, why don't you come and check out the teaching of the Buddha? Of, uh, see, see what his teaching is like. You know, maybe you'll get something from it. And Garahadina's like, uh, says, oh, tell me, what is, what is so good about uh, Samana Gotama's teaching? Oh, he knows everything. He's, uh, there's nothing he doesn't know about the past, the present, the future. He can read people's minds in 16 different ways. I don't know what the 16 different ways are, but... That's what the story says. So Garahadina says, Oh, well, then invite him to my house to, for next week or whenever. I'll, I'll, I'll feed him and I'll wor worship him and da 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 listen to his teaching. And Sri Guru says, Okay. And he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, Look, um, I got a, I got an invitation for you, but it's, you know, I've got to warn you. This friend of mine, he's offered to invite you for food, but I kind of played a practical joke on, on <laughs> On him, so he might be trying to get you back, get back, get me back for it by, you know, maybe dropping you in a ditch of cow dung or something. <laughs> <laughs> and the Buddha says, "I accept." You know, he thinks about it for a second. The Buddha thinks and sends his mind out and sees the future and sees what's going to happen. And so he says, "I accept." And meanwhile, back at Garahadina's place, he gets a whole bunch of wood and uh, digs a big, big trench, pit, uh, you know, ditch, right? Fills it up with wood and, and lights it on fire. And all night he has it burning and smoldering until he's got red hot coals. F this 
pit full of red-hot coals, and he covers it up with this uh, uh, some kind of logs that are smeared so that they don't burn, but uh, they kind of smolder, I don't know, some way of keeping it uh, under wraps, but still really, really hot. And uh, I guess like th these are like supports or something, but they're not going to burn. And then uh, on top of those, he puts these, these benches. Right, with the rope as well, I think, so that they're going to fall in. No, 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 he doesn't put benches. He puts some kind of very, very weak wood that's just going to snap and break and, and fall in. And then covers, up, covers it up. And uh, goes off and does the same with these pots. He takes these pots and smears the outside with, with whatever kind of food. And... Uh, and leaves them there. Sri Gutta comes along and says, oh, did you make food? And, and he's, the story makes him out to be kind of gullible, because I'd want to check in the pots after I did something like that, but he doesn't. He sees the pots and he says, oh, you know, okay, great, you've got food. Goes and gets the Buddha. The Buddha comes along with all the monks. And uh, Sri Gutta says, okay, but we've got, a, there's a rule in our, our, our family, we've got this custom, um, where the head the head teacher has to go in, or, so, or maybe he doesn't say it's a custom, he said, um, what I would like is for, the, for you, and he says to the Buddha, go in first and sit down, and then the monks come in. Cause he did this because he didn't want the other monks to see the Buddha fall into the pit. He wanted to ridicule the Buddha on his own. He thought if the other monks were there, I don't know, uh, they'd, they'd get in the way. So he decided he just wanted to make fun of the Buddha himself. Now here is what the story says happened. The Buddha walked over to the pit of fire and put his foot onto where the hot coals would have been, where he would have fallen through to the hot coals. And as soon as he put his foot down, a lotus, about this big, burst up from the, uh, from the coals and, uh, and, and lay itself out as a seat. And the Buddha went up on top of it and sat down on the lotus, and lotuses began to burst all along the trench, and uh, all the monks came in and sat on the lotuses. That's what the story says happened. Um, and so, so did, did suspend your disbelief because it's a cool story anyway. Uh, Garhadina, how do you think he felt when that happened? Not a happy camper. He was. Uh, he, he became agitated, and you know, when you see such a miracle like this, he got very, very uh, uh, agitated and upset. And he came up to the Buddha, and he bowed down at the Buddha, and he held his hands up, and he said, "Please, venerable sir, be my refuge." And he was just totally frightened. And the Buddha said, "Why? What's what's wrong?" And Garahadina says, um, "Truth is, I didn't make any food for today." I was just pretending to make food, and uh, you were supposed to fall into a pit of hot coals, which I see has just disappeared. And the Buddha said, "Well, didn't you tell me that, or didn't you say that there were there were these pots of food here and here and here?" And he says, "Yes, but I was lying. There's nothing in those pots." And the Buddha says, "Well, then go back and look at them again." And so Garahadina goes over to the pots opens up the one with rice and it's full of rice, opens up the one with ghee and it's full of ghee, opens up and all of the pots have are full of whatever food that he said was in them before. And Garahadina becomes very, very excited and, and gains faith in the Buddha and comes back and offers the Buddha food and all the monks food and they have a wonderful time, time with it and everyone lives happily ever after. No. Um, after the, then the, so the Buddha and the monks eat the meal, and after the meal the Buddha takes his hand out and washes his hand, and then uh, is going to give the Anumodana, which is uh, a, give a, a teaching uh, in thanks. So uh, the tradition is in thanks for, gi for the giving of food after the meal, the, uh, the Buddha or whatever senior monk is there will give a teaching as a sort of a thanks. And uh, in thanks he taught something based on this, uh, this verse. So he, he explained about how uh, disciples of the Blessed One have great wisdom and because of the, it's because of that great wisdom that they shine amongst uh, ordinary people. Even if they are, are born in a family or live in a town or a society that is full of 
evil and defilement and worldliness and blindness, and they uh, are still able to shine and uh, are still ab able to maintain their beauty and re retain their beauty. Just as a lotus can grow even from a rubbish heap and still be beautiful. So it wasn't the story. The, the 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 teaching really has nothing to do with the, or not much to do with the story. Uh, it just happens to be the the teaching that he gave to these guys. But the connection is that you, there's a difference between uh, one who is a, a real disciple of the Buddha and and one who is not. There's a great um, power and, and and goodness that comes from it. It's a um, Anyway, the, the, it's accentuating the difference between the, the two teachings. Now, as a result of the teaching, both Sri Gutta and uh, Garahadina became Sotapannas. And uh, many other people there were able to gain benefit from it as well. So then they both became true disciples of the Buddha. That's the story. The teaching, um, there's, there's not much there, but it's, um, it's an important teaching nonetheless. I think the, the most important part of it to me is the encouragement that it gives to us this this um, image of a lotus coming out of the the garbage or coming out of dirt or even in cow dung right a lotus can grow even in a rubbish heap it can grow in a compost heap and so too a a uh, a person who is dedicated and, and sincere can become enlightened even amongst people who are blind and evil and, and mean and nasty and so on, even in that case. So that when we're, when we're in a place or in a situation where we're surrounded or when, when we have to interact with people of that sort, we should just think of ourselves as the, as the lotus. And the Buddha said, just like a lotus, doesn't get wet when it rains, the water just slides off the lotus. Even so, we should try to uh, retain our purity even when defilements uh, come at us, when other people come at us with their defilements. This is really a, um, a quality of the meditation practice, of insight meditation practice, where it makes you stainless, it makes it impossible to um, disturb the mind. When, uh, when you see something and it's just seeing, then any defilements, right, the Buddha said, when you are nanubhyanjana gahi, nanimitta gahi, nanubhyanjana gahi, when you're someone who doesn't take the signs or the, the char characteristics of the object, just takes the object as it is. If it's seeing, see it as seeing. If it's hearing, know it as hearing. If it's smelling, know it as smelling. Thinking, know it as thinking. Pain, know it as pain. Liking, disliking, know it just as liking and disliking and so on. Cre this creates an objectivity that, that makes the mind perfectly invincible, uh, impenetrable, uh, imperturbable, uh, unsusceptible to the to, to harm. Uh, this is the, the quality that we, as, we aspire to in our practice and in our, on our path in the Buddha's teaching, to become objective. So that we, like the lotus, even, even surrounded by people shouting and screaming, people beating and hitting and fighting, and surrounded by hardship and suffering, even there we can find happiness, just like the lotus can grow even from the, uh, from the rubbish heap. That's the first part of the teaching, and it's really, I would say, the most important one, this idea of being stainless, of being imperturbable, of being unsullied by the world, by the anda buddha, the, the, the blindness around us, people who uh, cause suffering for themselves and suffering for others simply because they don't know any better, they don't see, because they can't see the truth. And um, putujana means full of defilements. They have so much desire and ad addiction and aversion and hatred and, and miserliness and stingy meanness, all these evil qualities. So our ability to stay above that, it really is possible to stay above that, and our ability to do so comes from the meditation practice, comes from our objectivity, 
your ability to take when someone's screaming at you to just know it as hearing, when someone's hitting you to know it as feeling or pain, when uh, we have unpleasant sounds or smells or tastes or feelings or thoughts, to just know them as they are. When you have racking, piercing pains, even such as would take your life, might take your life away, then you know them just as pain, not as good, as bad. And as a result, you, you are like the lotus that's unstained, unsullied by the dirt in which it arises. The second part is the emphasis on, the, on what makes a person shine, and that's the wisdom. And that's the, the essential quality of the meditation practice. What makes us shine and what, what allows us to become objective is wisdom, is seeing objects clearly as they are. This comes first with the actual application of the meditation. When you're just saying to yourself, seeing, seeing, or hearing, hearing, there arises a sort of a wisdom. You see the object clearly as it is, that's seeing, that's hearing. And that wisdom keeps the mind stainless, but that's only temporary. That's a, a um, freedom from defilement that is momentary. That as you begin to practice more and more and more, it becomes habitual. And then the mind starts to incline towards that state, and the mind becomes more and more objective by nature. This is a habitual objectivity that comes from someone who practices meditation long enough. The third, and, and the third is, through the, through the extended application and this habitual uh, application and, and inclination towards objectivity, eventually the mind breaks away from uh, defilement. It, it, it gives rise to this epiphany that allows one to uh, enter into Nibbāna. It means the mind doesn't go out to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, or thinking. There's no awareness whatsoever. There's a complete cessation of any kind of, ex any kind of sensual experience or, 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 or non-sensual experience, any kind of um, awareness whatsoever. So the mind, the mind uh, enters or, or stays put. Right? The mind stops. Uh, the mind stops. And with that, there is the experience of nibbana. Now that's what cuts off the defilements, because that experience, even just for a moment, allows one to see what true peace is, what true happiness is. And and so that is considered the highest form of wisdom, even though there's no thinking at the time. But this insight that allows us to see, or that, that is comprised of the seeing that everything else, everything arises and ceases, that there's, everything is susceptible to cessation. It's possible to enter into the cessation of all arisen things. This changes one's mind and, and um, shifts one's view and, and, and idea about uh, happiness and peace and, and freedom from suffering because one has realized true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. And that's the kind, that sort of wisdom um, is what truly makes one shine because from then on it's natural. Um, from then on one is uh, naturally and, and uh, inherently or what, um, by default, uh, objective and free from clinging. Now, in stages, of course, it takes repeated application and, and realization to fully and completely become enlightened, but even just the first time causes one to um, become dedicated to a certain level of ob objectivity. Now, this is different from the kind of wisdom that we would see in a ordinary person. So an ordinary person might claim to have wisdom, but it's completely on the side of uh, worldly wisdom. So it's, it's through, um, through reading and studying and hearing, sutta maya panya. So people who have wisdom, they've heard from other people, they have these pithy sayings and, and uh, ideas and beliefs that they've heard, which all of us as Buddhists also have. Um, and then also they have uh, jinta maya panya, which comes from thinking. And often as Buddhists we think this is the wisdom that we're looking for as well. So we, when, when a thought arises, yes, this is impermanent, yes, that is suffering, yes, that is non-self, so we think that's wisdom when we think about it like that. We think about our lives as being impermanent, changing all the time. 
We think of this as a type of wisdom. Now, these, these are both good and useful if applied in the right direction. Of course, if applied in the wrong direction, they're harmful. If you apply these sorts of wisdom to building a nuclear bomb, then they're quite harmful. But they're not true and they're not the highest wisdom and they don't lead one to shine because they're not natural. A person can have all the knowledge of the dangers of samsara and the problems with defilements and can even think about it and, and logically work it out and can still get angry. And still deep down have anger and greed, can still become addicted to things. They might be able to keep the precepts uh, because they've heard about keeping them, but the anger is still there that might cause them to kill. The greed is still there that might cause them to steal. These are not done away with because it's not, uh, it's not something that you see for yourself. It's not experiential wisdom. The, um, the true wisdom is that which comes from seeing for yourself, it comes from experience, it comes from changing your your uh, perception of, of the world. This comes from actual application and the observation and the study of reality. So meditation in Buddhism is really the study of reality and this is what causes one to shine. There's a, a radiance to someone who sees things clearly. They, the things they say, the things they do, the things they think are pure and clear, peaceful, are beneficial, are pleasant to others. Their presence is something that is um, that is appreciated by other people. So they are in that way like a lotus, even surrounded by people who are defiled. They don't become defiled as a result. They are beautiful and and radiant and delightful to others. Manoramang, they, they are delightful to the mind. So that is the teaching today, verses 8, 58 and 59. Thank you all for tuning in and everyone for coming out tonight. Now we will continue on with uh, some meditation practice. <laughs>